Hello and welcome to the 21st episode of Karl Marx's 18th premiere of Louis Napoleon Reading Group series. Today is Thursday the 4th of February 2021 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. We continue on our merry way through Chapter 6, The Victory of Bonaparte. This week I have the new patrons Ben Lassinger and Fastbullet to thank. If you like the sound of extra Patreon-only episodes and live streams, and want to keep the lights on and the episodes flowing, head on over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar. Okay, let's rejoin the discussion. James, how do you feel about reading this long bit here? Yeah, yeah man, this is this is good. This is the bit with the disintegration, the decomposition, and the dry infusoria. <laughs> it sounds like something from like you know what's that American cop show where they have all the forensics and the crap science? Was it CSI? Yes, CSI. CSI. <laughs> it sounds like James is like talking about CSI Miami Beach or something here. <laughs> okay, right. I have at it. The disintegration of the Party of Order did not stop at its original elements. Each of the two great factions, in its turn, decomposed all over again. It was as if all the old shadings that had formerly fought and jostled one another within each of the two circles, whether legitimist or or Orleanist, had thawed out again like dry infusoria on contact with water, as if they had acquired a new sufficient vital energy to form groups of their own and independent antagonisms. The legitimists dreamed they were back among the controversies between the Tuileries and the Pavillon Marsan, between Viet and Polignac, the Orleanists relived the golden days of the tourney between Guizot, Molay, Broly, Thiers and Odillon Barotte. The section of the party of order that was eager for revision, but was divided again on the limits to revisions, a section composed of the legitimists led by Barrière and Fallou on the one hand, and by La roche Jacla on the other, and of the conflict-weary Orleanists led by Molay, Broly, Montalambar and Odillon Barotte, agreed with the Bonapartist representatives on the following indefinite and broadly framed motion, with the object of restoring to the nation the full exercise of its sovereignty, the undersigned representatives moved that the constitution be revised. At the same time, however, they unanimously declared through their reporter, Tocqueville, there he is, that the National Assembly had no right to move the abolition of the Republic, that this right was vested solely in the revising chamber. For the rest, the constitution might be revised only in a quote-unquote legal manner. Hence, only if the constitutionally prescribed three-quarters of the number of votes were cast in favour of revision. On July 19th, after six days of stormy debate, revision was rejected, as was to be anticipated. 446 votes were cast for it, but 278 against. The extreme Orleanists, Thiers, Jean Grenier, etc., voted with the Republicans and the Montagna. Thus, the majority of Parliament declared against the Constitution. But this Constitution itself declared for the minority and that its vote was binding. But had not the Party of Order subordinated the Constitution to the parliamentary majority on May 31st, 1850, and on June 13th, 1849, up to now, was not its whole policy based on the subordination of the paragraphs of the Constitution to the decisions of the parliamentary majority? Had it not left to the Democrats the antediluvian superstitions, belief in the letter of the law, and castigated the Democrats for it? At the present moment, however, revision of the Constitution meant nothing but continuation of the presidential authority, just as the continuation of the Constitution meant nothing but Bonaparte's deposition. Parliament had declared for him but the Constitution declared against Parliament. He had therefore acted in the sense of Parliament when he tore up the Constitution and acted in the sense of the Constitution when he adjourned Parliament. Boom. <laughs> that is a fucking great line. Yeah. I want to read that one again. Let me read this one here. He therefore acted in the sense of Parliament when he tore up the Constitution and acted in the sense of the Constitution when he adjourned the Parliament. That is a hell of an analytical statement. Yeah, I have, I have um, in my physical copy, it's the, the wording is slightly changed, and I like it. It says, therefore, he carried out the will of Parliament when he tore up the Constitution. 
and he carried out the will of the constitution when he sent parliament packing. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very English way of putting this, isn't it? Yeah, it's an, it's an English uh, guy who did the translation. This is the Terrell Carver one, I think, yeah. You know, for, for a long time when people said dialectical, I thought they just meant writing like that because it sounds like neat and, you know, sometimes it fits the content. Because in this case, like, it's, it's a pretty sick burn and it's like a nice poetic line. I don't know if you're familiar with, like, underground hip-hop from the 90s. They do this stuff a lot. I didn't nice. realize backpackers were so dialectical. <laughs> You've got to take some joy, some glee in the catastrophic fuck ups of these assholes and the ways in which they tie themselves in knots, the ways in which their prior actions go on to sabotage them later on. Because ultimately, you know, the proletariat lost this fight. And so. It's good to have some, you know, schadenfreude at, at all these, these pieces of shit. It's like squabbles between the, the elite, isn't it? And it's nice mm. to see some of them just being so inept that they got from a position of power to get their ass handed by a kind of a moron. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Like, yeah, heirs to the throne, usurped by this fucking fail son. It's but, neat. By a fail son who launched, like, what was the one he did? I think he landed over somewhere like in Brittany with, like, yeah. the French people that were living in England, exiles, and, like, they all got arrested in about, like, an hour or something. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's they, right. Like, so I, it's kind of interesting, like, if we look to, say, what's going on in the States right now, and you look at, say, this kind of idea we have here as, like, the legitimacy is Orle and Orleanists as... Democrats and Republicans, I do feel that the that they really can will combine and do always in the name of capital, much more so they're less split, amazingly less split than say this party of order. They're they're, well, they're functional for capital. There there's also something about the bourgeois republic in America that gives them a stronger common cause, right? Because essentially they can both commit to the idea that, well, you know, after the other party gets in power, we'll have our turn. And uh, right. that's just kind of how things go because neither of them have that much popularity. Neither of them are really interested in that much popularity. And, it's just going to kind of go back and forth. And that is not the case with monarchy, right? With monarchy, if the, if the legitimist line was uh, acceded to the throne, the Republic was abolished and the legitimist had a son. And then the Orleanist would just be reduced to a cadet house. And that would be that. And they would have to be back to maybe, you know, a century of scheming as opposed to a decade or something. They probably would have to end it up like on the equivalent of Jeffrey Epstein Island, like Prince, poor old Prince Andrew was. That's probably, you know, no one wasn't given that. Um, I mean, you could have just, you know, have got their heirs together and go, now cues like they used to do with the old royal houses. But yeah, let's go for the yeah. Jeffrey Epstein one. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the Epsteinist... Line. Oh, God. Uh, oh Jesus Christ! Prince, Prince, Prince Andrew and the Epsteinist faction. <laughs> you know, I, I feel like all uh, all socialist podcasts are going asymptotically towards QAnon. <laughs> Do you remember uh, the Royals went uh, against the Sun and the News of the World in the UK about tapping their phones? The journalists were tapping their mobile phones and reading uh -huh. their messages. And it was a big thing where they got, uh, Rupert Murdoch had to go in front of a commission. Yeah. And since then, the Murdochs have hated the royal family. That's why the Sun have really been covering the Prince Andrew stuff. That's it's, it, clearly, yeah. it's, clearly wow. of, it's clearly a result of Leveson and Murdoch basically yeah. still like being super pissed off about that. Yeah. Do, you remember, do you remember about a year after that, they managed to get their hands. No one ever said how they got it, but I reckon it was probably, they, I don't know, because was, there was only supposed to be one copy of it, apparently, of the Queen doing Nazi salutes when she was a kid and the Queen oh, yeah. Get the fuck out of here. 
Yeah, yeah and and the son ran with it on the front page, like yeah. about a year. Wow. And I think they reckon that they think that they actually got them to break into fucking the palace. I think I remember reading something, probably some. Wow. Bullshit. But that I, was like I mean, state secret. Wow. And they got out of the front page of the fucking sun. I mean, like Prince, what's the fuck, you know, the, the, whatever his name I, is. The, yeah, he, he, I'm sure he does Nazi salutes all the time. But like the queen, now that's a scoop. <laughs> yeah. It's the son that won it. <laughs> like mother and the queen and like the queen is like seven or eight or whatever eight yeah or and i remember that it's like 40 and she's like giving up they're, they're doing it and they're smiling and you can see they're obviously fucking well for it it was from about 1937 or six or something like this so before the war oh, okay if you if you if you google it there is the picture online and the, the front line of the sun that day <laughs> is is their royal highness yeah, <laughs> oh, that's a that's an awful pun. That's pretty good. I like that. That's about the, that's that's about complete, the level of humor yeah. I would expect from the tabloid press. Yeah, that's like complete, like uh, dead standard stock in trade for the same. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, you want to workshop that one in the writers' room for a little bit. Yeah. Like this is like they're like got him, got him. This yeah. is what the writers' room were thinking uh, when they published yeah, that. Yeah. They're like, just rush to press, like, no need to, you know, workshop this in my DMs. Like, a 16-year-old on Twitter, the average one could come with, with a better pun than that. You know, he's putting more thought into it. But I guess if you have the content, you don't have to, you don't have to workshop it. Tom, use your screen for good, and please Google and or Bing image search that uh, Queen Heil. There's a picture of it on the BBC website, and the, it all, the, the, it the all, uh, Buckingham, Buckingham Palace's comment was they were quote unquote disappointed at the usage. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. There we go. The there we go. This is my nice happy family. Mein so, Gott. I think there's more than one as well. There's definitely one of the Queen Mother. I remember seeing it like this. It's actually from a video. And but, I mean, uh, far more recently than this, there's Prince Harry in like full brown shirt regalia yeah. at a house party. <laughs> Prince Harry is woke now. It's it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> all all, all it's is cool. forgiven. <laughs> he's really progressive. He's saying pro uh, profits over people now. I'm sorry. Uh, he's saying people over profits now. It's fine. You know, Hitler would never say that. Well, he's 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 uh you know exiled himself from the the royal house and he's he's gone to fucking Hollywood. He's that's true. He's, he's gone Republican rogue. now. Yeah, he's in he bourgeois royalty now. You know, yeah. top from one tabloid to the other. You know, this is this is the start of the Orleanist house. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, in the yeah. British, <laughs> we got that. We've got we've got the bourgeois king uh, in the making in Prince Harry. I don't know if anybody can see this one. Like, my, this is my, uh, my, my, my missus is... Okay, uh, Tom. Okay. Oh, God damn it. God damn it, Tom. Okay, Tom. My, my, my missus is uh, friend. This guy, Rob Wall. She's really good friends with him. And uh, he, made a, he made a career. He literally made a career working for, for the Metro in London of doing articles with uh, puns on the word Uranus. He would look up scientific articles. Oh, and my God. Uh, Hubble just spotted something massive coming out of Uranus. There's another one. Uranus gapes open wide and emits hot gases. He literally, he had like wow. <laughs> newspaper for like three years. He had every single one of them. Do us a favor and don't Google that one. Jesus Christ. <laughs> you'll, get, you'll get banned from YouTube. Yeah. That's like the best job I could ever imagine. Just Googling <laughs> up scientific articles about Uranus. <laughs> we, uh... Hey, uh, we're, we're all a bunch of suckers. You know, we could just be having, you know, pun-based income and instead we're doing deep reads of, you know, the 18th Brumaire. What the hell's wrong with us? It has been, as we all know from Futurama, you know, the, the it has been rationally renamed to avoid such jokes to your rectum. <laughs> yeah. Rectum nearly killed him. Now... Oh, but they actually employed another guy after he left there and he went to work somewhere else and they employed him and his, his puns are really crap. They have him still on the Uranus pun, pun train. Okay, okay, let's keep going. Okay, so while all this was going on and all the revision stuff was being debated in Parliament, Bonaparte went in and he got rid of General Dillier's, uh, who had been basically totally against him, and he put him in his place, uh, a loyalist 
for Bonaparte. I'll give, I'll give this bit a, a go. The Party of Order proved by its decision on revision that it knew neither how to rule nor how to serve, neither how to live nor how to die, neither how to suffer the Republic nor how to overthrow it, neither how to uphold the Constitution nor how to throw it overboard, neither how to cooperate with the President nor how to break with him. To whom then did it look for the solution of all the contradictions? To the calendar, to the course of events. It ceased to presume to sway them. It therefore challenged events to assume sway over it, and thereby challenged the power to which, in the struggle against the people, it had surrendered one attribute after another, until it stood impotent before this power. In order that the head of the executive power might be able to more undisturbedly to draw up his plan of campaign against it, strengthen his means of attack, select his tools and fortify his positions, it resolved precisely at this critical moment to retire from the stage and adjourn for three months from August 4th to November 4th. Yet again, they've done this so many goddamn times. Do they not learn from their mistakes? God damn it. Why am I saying God damn it? I, I'm glad they learned. Uh, the parliamentary party was not only dissolved from its, into, its two, into its two great factions, each of these factions was not only split up within itself, but the party of order in Parliament had fallen out with the party of order outside Parliament. The spokesmen and scribes of the bourgeoisie, its platform and its press, in short, the ideologists of the bourgeoisie and the bourgeoisie itself, the representatives and the represented, faced one another in, a str in estrangement and no longer understood one another. Le the legitimists in the provinces with their limited horizon and unlimited enthusiasm, accused their parliamentary leaders, Berrier and Fallou, of deserting to the Bonapartist camp and of defection from Henry V. Their fleur-de-lis minds believed in the fall of man, but not in diplomacy. Far more fateful and decisive was the breach of the commercial bourgeoisie with its politicians. It reproached them, not as the legitimists reproached theirs, with having abandoned their principles, but on the contrary, with clinging to principles that had become useless. I indicated above that since Fool's entry into the ministry, the section of the commercial bourgeoisie which had held the lion's share of power under Louis Philippe, namely the aristocracy of finance, had become Bonapartist. Fool not only represented Bonaparte's interest in the bourse, he represented at the same time the interests of the bourse before Bonaparte. The position of the aristocracy of finance is most strikingly depicted in a passage from its European organ, the London Economist. In the issue of February the 1st, 1851, its Paris correspondent writes, Now we have it stated from numerous quarters that above all things, France demands tranquility. The president declares it in his message to the legislative assembly. It is echoed from the tribune. It is asserted in the journals. It is announced from the pulpit. It is demonstrated by the sensitiveness of the public funds at the least prospect of disturbance and their firmness the instant it is made manifest that the executive is victorious. In its issue of November 29, 1851, The Economist declares in its own name, the president is a guardian of order and is now recognized as such on every stock exchange of Europe. Sometimes when you read like 20th century political economy on fascism, you see them really harping on the aristocracy of finance and their role in Bonapartism. Now, you might think that's wrong, you might think that's right, but the point is, that's coming from Marx. Like, and, you know, at least in Marx's day, he could flex with some economist quotes to back him up. Yeah, like, and in France at the time, like, was it an anti-Semitic trope? Do you think? Were the was it was it uh, were like in France where was the Jewish community heavily in the banking? It does I don't know. Like I don't know. Like is that what you're getting at, Ezri? That's that wasn't what I was getting at necessarily, but I think you know that's a good point. There might be something to the way that finance capital is a bit more how shall we say enterprising in the sorts of things that it will back, no risk, no reward, in order to like make the world safe for capital but i don't know sometimes sometimes financiers could be more split on these things i don't actually know the class breakdown during this period of history but marx has a point throughout here 
that the aristocracy of finance, which if you think about it, is sort of a weird word. I think it's more literal in, or it's, it's a weird phrase. I think it's more literal in France than it would be in the United States, for instance. But yeah, he's been fairly consistent about this through the Bermiere. I mean, listen, it may have been an anti-Semitic trope in France. It was certainly an anti-Semitic trope in Germany, where Marx is writing. But I think, you know... <laughs> Look, you know, an aristocracy of finance. Like, no, know. no, no. See, that's the thing. There was an aristocracy of finance. And in France, I think that this was more like actually related to uh, not just, you know, yeah, new bourgeois that like struck it rich, but was sort of, uh, Kyle, I think you might have explained that there was a literal like aristocratic connection with finance capital in France. So taking on that premise, if that's the case, however structurally anti-Semitic, you know, critiques of finance capital could be, in this situation, you have a, France is rather anti-Semitic, and so you, if you have, so there are establishment figures crossing over into finance capital, you probably don't have a more anti-Semitic section of society that's actually being talked about. So I'm not entirely sure on this, but I do think that the finance capital was associated with Protestants and also with 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 Jews. So it, it wasn't a purely anti-Semitic thing from what I remember about French history. That explains, you know, like what he talks about earlier on. I think we read where he says we're going to have to give up our Protestant church. And- mm, yeah. Have I um, have I overstated the links between sort of older aristocracy and finance? Because, you know, that's certainly not the case in other places. Uh, uh, sometimes Marx and Engels will use aristocracy in a less literal sense. Uh, I think that comes out of the Tocqueville kind of looking for new aristocrats in different places. You know, from what I understand, the biggest financiers in France were not necessarily from the nobility not to say that they didn't have nobles among them, but I, I think it is. I think that the finance capital was fairly bourgeois. From what okay, I all right. Cut um, my bullshitting, Tom. Yes, this is kind of anti-Semitic, but if you think about it, Marx is one of the le- like. Even though there's a bunch of anti-Semitic shit that Marx said, Marx is still one of the least anti-Semitic socialists at the writing at the time. Yeah, like I wonder for Marx himself. Like I don't know. I have no idea, but like. You know, like, you know, when Irish people talk about Irish people, we talk about, like, you know, our potato heads, how we're all ugly and potato eating, you know, muck savages. So, like, I wonder if our Marx was there some of that, like, the ability, you know, like, it's like listening to Jewish comedians tell Jewish jokes. I wonder, is there some of that for Marx himself or was he kind of anti-Semitic? You know what I mean? Uh, It's complicated because he, you know, was not writing for a Jewish audience. You know, mm-hmm. and, you know, his father converted and his, you know, family went to great lengths, to present themselves as Christians. So it's more of like a, an Adolf Reed where you're sort of like the, presenting a story for people that aren't your people that kind of cuts against your interests or something. I did want to talk about that point about finance capital and, and uh, fascism. Yes, we can find examples of it in The Economist here, but let's not forget the reaction of finance capital to the rise of Bolsonaro. Like Mm. that was overwhelmingly positive. You know, even the CBC news was like, yeah, this is, this is the best. This is great. You know, speaking Mm -hmm. with the voice of finance capital there, like Canadian finance capital. That is absolutely standard for all the, you know, types of like regime change in Latin America, at least going back to the seventies. If you look at the coverage and the economists and that sort of thing, mm-hmm. making yeah. the world safe for quote democracy. Uh, for about 10 years, I read, uh, maybe not 10, but like at least five years, I read every issue of the economist literally front to back when I used to think it was uh, an actual sensible magazine. <laughs> it was like literally some of the only intellectual, semi intellectual material I was ever exposed to at that stage on some of this stuff. And they, it was literally every week, depending on what country you're talking about, they made that exact point every single time, every single time. They do not hide it. It is explicit. 
if it wasn't the case, you know, earlier, it certainly is the case these days. No risk, no reward, baby. I, not that this is finance capital exactly, but uh, I don't know. Elon Musk on Twitter recently tweeted, we'll coup whoever we want. I feel like that's in keeping with the spirit here. The real visionaries of the bourgeoisie. I really like this. I want to read this part here again for people. I want people to think all about Joe Biden. OK, let's go. To whom then did it look for the solution, for the solution of all the contradictions, to the calendar, to the course of events? It ceased to presume to sway them. It therefore challenged events to assume sway over it and thereby challenged the power to which, in the struggle against the people, it had surrendered one attribute after another until it stood impotent before this power. I, I find there's something going on, like what's going on in America now where they just think, is this you know, election in four months time. Oh, this will be our, this will be what we need. It just seems like, I don't know, this re- this point really reminds me of current events. It's not exact, but it just reminds me, it rhymes. Uh, the position of the, of the Democrats is somewhat more rational, right? Because there's a reasonable chance that they will win the election. But yeah, I mean... It does seem like they may be relying overly much on the power of the calendar because it seems like the election might be contested, in which case they're going to actually have to get into it, you know? Would the party of order not won the election again, do people think? Because they still have a massive majority. Are, are we uh, lost in history or are we uh, lifting this into the present now? Well, I, I think the party of order actually was very unpopular at this point of time. So they didn't really have a strong chance of winning an election. That's correct, right? Like nobody was really pro yeah. party of order. Yeah, from what I like what Marx is depicting here is how they kind of like destroyed their own fan base, like and how masterfully some chump like Napoleon the third could you know play off the different factions against each other and play off parliament and the whole republican legacy against each other yeah he says he says just a little bit further on that the industrial bourgeoisie too and its fanaticism for order was angered by the squabbles of the parliamentary party of order so yeah it's this kind of the 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 thirst for order is uh fracturing their relationship with their supposed parliamentary representation i guess well, let's, let's go there then. Let's do a bit of reading. Uh, Puya, are you up for a bit of reading or have you fallen asleep there? The aristocracy of finance, therefore, condemned the parliamentary struggle of the party of order with the executive power as a disturbance of order and celebrated every victory of the president over its ostensible representative as a victory of order. By the aristocracy of finance must here be understood not merely as a great loan promoter's and speculators in public funds, in regard to whom it is immediately obvious that their interests coincide with the interests of state power. All modern finance, the whole of the banking business, is interwoven in the closest fashion with public credit. A part of their business capital is necessarily invested and put out at interest in quickly convertible public funds. Their deposits, the capital placed at the disposal and distributed by them among the merchants and industrious, are partly derived from the dividends of holders of government securities. If, in every epoch, the stability of the state power signified Moses and the prophets to the entire money market and to the priests of this money market, why not all the more so today, when every deluge threatens to sweep away the old states and the old states' debts with them? The industrial bourgeoisie, too, in its fanaticism for order, was angered by the squabbles of the Parliamentary Party of Order with the executive power. After their vote of January 18th on the occasion of Changarnier's dismissal, Thiers, Anglis, saint Bueve, etc., received from their constituents in precisely the industrial districts public reproofs in which their coalition with the Montang was especially scourged as high treason to order. If, as we have seen, Boastful taunts and petty petty intrigues which marked the struggles of the party of order with the president merited no better reception. Then, on the other hand, this bourgeois party required its representatives to allow the military power to pass from its own parliament 
to an adventurous pretender without offering resistance was not even worth the intrigues that were squandered in its interest. It proved that the struggle to maintain its public interests, its own class interests, its political power, only troubled and upset it as a disturbed private business. So, so here we have it. We've had the, the, the aristocracy of finance had enough of them and the industrialists had enough of them. So basically, the industrial bourgeoisie were like saying, look, you just let go. You, you gave the army over to Bonaparte. You're totally useless. Why should we do anything for you? You know, why, why should we put stock in what, what you guys are doing? And there was a great line in here, which is, let, let me read this one line in here again. If in every epoch the stability of the state power signified Moses and the prophets to the entire money market and to the priests of this money market, why not all the more so today when every deluge threatens to sweep away the old states and the old state debts with them? So Moses, eh? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, were you going to say, Tom? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> that's true. But the, the, the thing is here is like, we, we see that like every time like, when when Napoleon would do well, I think we I don't know if we discovered it yet, we've read it yet, but when the executive would basically win out over the parliament, stocks would go up. And every time he'd lose out, stocks would go down. And mm -hmm. you know, so <laughs> what we're seeing here is that like the the fact that if you kept the republic as a going concern now and the voting, and if you had the risk of the social democrats coming back or or even worse for the capitalists you were basically risking all the existing state the, and the debts and all the money there and the structure of society so you know they were bound to go against they were bound to back napoleon if he was showing a much stronger ability to represent the interests of finance capital in this case but all capital by the sounds of it yeah, and uh, Derek in the chat has an asterisk to our conversation about the section of capital. He says it's rentier capital, so it's the uh, so it's finance capital being you know the biggest sector. So yeah, it's that chunk of capitalists, not exactly the industrialists, that are um, pushing this. The industrialists kind of have their own class faction. They do, but they've decided to go along with what the finance capital is pushing because they're disgusted with the intrigues of the party border. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Like I'm wondering, will we do one more paragraph and then we'll call it a night. Okay. Let's uh, do it. This, this little section here is Bonaparte was going around on tours and everybody was giving him a good reception. Like all the bourgeoisie were giving him a good reception everywhere he went. Okay. Now we're going to get into a little bit of the economic stuff. That, that that sort of going around making speeches and, and kind of like making digs at the party of order, that, that's very Trump, I'll just say, you know, like his little, the party of order. Little, these little jokes. You see, the, <laughs> you see their jacket? They got like a, an old jacket from the 1950s. I feel bad for them. I'm going to buy them a new jacket. Okay. When trade was good, as it still was at the beginning of 1851, the commercial bourgeoisie raged against any parliamentary struggle, lest trade be put out of humor. When trade was bad, as it continually was from the end of February 1851, the commercial bourgeoisie accused the parliamentary struggles of being the cause of stagnation and cried out for them to stop so that trade could start again. The revision debates came on just in this bad period. Since the question here was whether the existing form of state was to be or not to be, the bourgeoisie felt all the more justified in demanding from its representatives the ending of this torturous provisional arrangement and at the same time the maintenance of the status quo. There was no contradiction in this. By the end of the provisional arrangement, it understood precisely its continuation, the postponement to a distant future of the moment when a decision had to be reached. The status quo could be maintained in only two ways, prolongation of Bonaparte's authority or his constitutional retirement and the election of Cavagnac. A section of the bourgeoisie desired the latter solution and knew no better advice to give its representatives than to keep silent and leave the burning question untouched. They were of the opinion that if their representatives did not speak, Bonaparte would not act. 
They wanted an ostrich parliament that would hide its head in order to remain unseen. Another section of the bourgeoisie desired, because Bonaparte was already in the presidential chair, to leave him sitting in it so that everything could remain in the same old rut. They were indignant because their parliament did not openly infringe the constitution and abdicate without ceremony. So it comes down to the status that there's a sentence in the middle. The status quo could be maintained in only two ways, prolongation of Bonaparte's activity or his constitutional retirement, the election of Cavagnac. There's no uh, indication in this paragraph the latter solution won't work. It's that the pro-Bonaparte faction of the bourgeoisie, they actually weren't really in favor of an abolition of the republic. They just kind of wanted Bonaparte to stay in charge. Fair. There's two factions, right? There's the, the, the Cavagnac faction and the Bonaparte faction. The Cavagnac faction basically encouraged its representatives to sit on their hands and do very little because they assumed that Bonaparte would not act without provocation. And the pro-Bonaparte pro Bonaparte faction basically wanted the extension of Bonaparte's term. They did not necessarily want an abolition of the Republic, but they did want an mm -hmm. extension of Bonaparte's term. So a, re uh, a revision of the Constitution to that effect was needed. Right. So basically, if the Kavanaugh faction had leveraged its power and spoke up, it could have mitigated how far Bonaparte was able to go. Yeah. And they didn't because they figured, well, you know, Bonaparte has bided his time in the past, like, why won't he do the same again, right? You know, because they were more of the uh, adhering to the calendar strategy, right? Like, we won't, we weren't, we're not going to, we're going to let sleeping dogs lie, we're not going to make waves, and we're just going to wait till the election, and then his term will be up, and we'll elect Cavagnac, and then we're, we're golden. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. When I was reading this initially, I thought, like, uh, appealing to the calendar was some kind of, like, nationalist appeal to the French Revolution or something. I don't know. Appealing to the calendar yeah. now that... <laughs> they name, like, a, a, a day after hemp or something. Oh, it's so quaint. But, <laughs> the the Brumaris. But, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, right, yeah, exactly. That's kind of what I thought they were going for, or Marx was going for. I suppose, like, that, not to be too presentist, but, yeah, that adhering to the calendar, let's wait for the election, let's let, let's let our institutions uh, decide this, let's sit on our hands, Not we don't want to overplay our hand, let's just let, let the Bonapartists uh, overplay their hand. And instead of overplaying their hand, they just kind of run with it and do something unprecedented, because they basically have no real opposition. Now, that last part, I don't... It's that part's kind of different. We have a more united party of order, essentially. Uh, I guess yeah. if you wanted to break that down game theoretically, like, but and yeah, and there's less like of a class conflict between our two sides of our party of order. <laughs> They're basically like two flavors of, of similar bourgeois coalitions, not the same, but you know, similar pacts. Yeah, like Trump still has bourgeois supporters, like you know, big funders in the bourgeoisie but I get the impression that they're very much in the minority uh, and finance capital is not really on his side. Elements. He has the, uh, what to call the people who, who were his biggest funders. They are like right-wing hedge fund guys. Arthur Capital, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Especially at, uh, at first, like, you know, earlier in the presidency, like uh, there was, you mm. know, big yeah, stock yeah, yeah, market yeah. booms when, uh, Trump got in the big investor confidence restoration. Um, yeah, so I, there I, I was sort of a similar dynamic. I don't get the impression he has that support at this moment. He, ha he definitely has support from some members yeah. of finance capital, but I don't get the impression that, like, you know, the economist is head over heels for Trump. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> Wall Street Journal or whatever. Uh, MSNBC, I don't know. I mean, MSNBC is, is weirdly sort of seen as the uh, left wing of the media. Uh, which is bonkers. But they, but like, they have uh, oh, C C CNBC. Time, right? yeah. Oh, yeah, CNBC. CNBC. Yeah, sorry. Thank you, yeah. Sorry. Our, uh, media alphabet soup isn't as, is just about as brain-melting as the left. But, yeah, like, 
that is not the case here. Trump has a Trump has a genuine crisis of uh, legitimacy, essentially, like his approval readings are not great. And they've been surprisingly high throughout most of his presidency, you know, COVID and the, the you know, sending in the feds has really like tanked him with a lot of people that would normally. Be. But yeah, I think most of Trump's support is just from like a group of like extremely loyal What's the word? Like dogmatic. You have weird stuff like the what is it? The the CEO of of Wendy's is a big Trump guy. The CEO of Disney is a big big Trump supporter. But they don't they don't talk openly about it too much. It's more just reported that they are giving lots of money to him. And the mattress king guy. Yeah, there's a mattress king guy. He's a real weirdo. What's his deal? He's quite. He's got quite a fruity background. I think he he was like super into like crack and booze, and he had like a real like you know life turnaround story. But he's like a big Trump donor. Uh, does he say like really unusual things? Sounds yeah, like he's he's quite. He's, he's, he's usually quite amusing. Whenever I've only had like you know clip, clips of him on like you know Majority Report kind of shows, like so I've never like seen him in a full interview. I've only ever heard clips, so it doesn't really give him the. Uh, adequate context but it does sound like quite a fruity movie that's for sure it's like kanye <laughs> <laughs> kanye is a trump supporter <laughs> not anymore oh not yeah, he's anymore like, he's like half of a trump supporter i think <laughs> i think he just likes his aesthetic the 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 uh the woke woke dominionist candidate in kanye has collapsed since we last talked so just just noting that for history <laughs> Uh, that, uh, you know, woke Gilead is not on the horizon. <laughs> I think he has, like, a conflict with, like, his his aesthetic and, like, his rational, you know, the rational part of his brain and, like, the reptilian part of his brain. <laughs> he's like a combination of Bernie and Trump, I think. He, he's somebody, he strikes me as somebody who has, like, mental health problems. <laughs> That's why he actually strikes me. On this episode, you heard the theme tune The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. The artwork for the show was created by the Korean artist and author of the 2019 Marx Engels illustration book. You can check out links to his work and Twitter account in the show notes. Thank you for listening and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science and Swampside Chats. Thank you.